So the first presentation uh, is by myself uh, from the project here at uh, Tech Hills. Um, and to begin with, very importantly, what is our ambition here? Uh, first of all, well, the main, the main ambition is to achieve the first fully automated, fully autonomous, stewardless, and long-term project in Belgium. And this is a very simple statement, but it contains two very innovative components. Uh, first of all, stewardless, fully autonomous. Um, we have not seen that yet in Belgium, so that if we achieve that milestone, which should be any day now, that uh, would be an important milestone for mobility in Belgium. Uh, and also the component long term is very important here. Usually we have um, demonstration projects, short-lived projects um, which are running for maybe a couple of weeks or a couple of months, usually with a steward on board. And after that time uh, the project is done, the shuttles leave again and nothing is uh, sticking, so to say. We are an investment company. We are not a uh, public authority who wants to get experience in this to prepare for the future. We are not a research institute who wants to do research. Um, we are a site owner who wants a transport solution for their site. And if that is the mindset with which you jump into a project, then you have a whole different need than when it is just a demonstration project. Um, so the first fully autonomous transport system for the long term in Belgium, that is our goal. Not because we want it, because it's nice, but because we believe that it is a general transport solution and we believe it can be uh, a better solution even today than the more traditional approach of having uh, buses with a driver. Uh, and the second goal is that we want to have uh, a living lab for autonomous vehicles, for autonomous vehicle studies and technology um, here at the Hills. Um, I will come back to that later in my presentation. Um, I want to highlight the project partners, uh, to thank all of them, of course. So we as LRM are the promoter of the project. We are also the investor of the project. Uh, but we are supported by our project partners, Flanders Make, Knowledge Institute, who also do technology tests and research around autonomous mobility. So they are uh, our uh, main support when it comes to the Living Lab component and when it comes to the technology part. And then we have, of course, the Flemish uh, public transport transport company, The Lane, um, who have been extremely helpful also in the tender phase because they have uh, already worked on that. And of course, their general knowledge on collective transport solutions is of high value to the project. Uh, and the project is also supported by uh, Ter Hills, obviously, from an operational perspective, uh, that we are allowed to do this project here at uh, this beautiful site. And uh, we are very happy and very grateful for the financial support of uh, the two Flemish ministers, who have both given some very inspiring uh, welcome words. So thank you once more for that. Um, and also by the European Commission. So, and that also underlines, I think, the... Um, the fact that this is uh, an innovative project, that we have so many public entities that are willing to support this project financially. Um, and we couldn't have done it without that support, so we are extremely happy and grateful for that. Uh, of course, I want to highlight our technology partners as well, because they are, of course, the guys and girls who need to make sure that this actually happens. Um, so after I can say a uh, very tense and very competitive uh, tender phase, which took uh, some, a bit over a year. Um, we landed with EasyMile as the main technology provider. Um, as Tom already indicated, they are a world leader in uh, autonomous uh, solutions. Uh, and their Easy 10 vehicles have been running, I think, in more than 400 projects by now in, uh, in dozens of countries. Uh, and after testing and, uh, and evaluating several technology solutions, we are convinced, even before they started here, of course today we are even more convinced that we have found the best possible technology to deploy here at Ter Hills. And we're also happy uh, that they have uh, coupled with Ush, uh, a Belgian startup company focused on autonomous transportation. Um, so Ush is uh, in Belgium uh, very well known for it. I don't think there are many autonomous vehicle projects that uh, do not in one way or another have been uh, 
uh, have been involved by, uh, by us. And they are contributing to the project, uh, for instance, by, uh, the by doing the operations now during the pilot phase of our project, but they also have important roles in uh, the user interfaces that will be developed, for instance, for the bus stops, uh, and, in working, and also working on the uh, algorithm optimization for when we come to a, a fleet of, of shuttles that they run in the most optimal way possible. Very briefly, uh, the shuttle route, so you can see a lot of nice pictures which Rudy already uh, has used as well. So I won't go too much into all the things that are uh, here at the hills, but I just want to highlight how we connect these dots with one another. So you can see in red the connection that we are doing. Uh, so here in the center is one of the most beautiful viewpoints in Belgium. Uh, so it's on top of the Terril. And we have a shuttle track basically going completely around the Terril. Um, so, but we decided to take the northern half of the route and to operate it in both directions to optimize the connectivity and the, co uh, and the connection between the different points of attraction. Um, in total, we uh, have five stops. So uh, in no particular order, we have the stop at uh, Eliza Energetic Wellness, where also the pontoon bridge uh, will be built, um, which should be finished, if I'm not mistaken, uh, around the end of the year. So this will be a major new uh, cycling attraction point uh, in Belgium. No, no, don't laugh, we will manage. <laughs> so by the end of the year. Um, so that will be a major attraction point uh, because our province Limburg has several uh, of these iconic cycling attractions so far. And we see that uh, not only cyclists, but also uh, uh, hikers and all kinds of people um, visit this. So we expect that this will be quite an important attraction point, um, which we will also operate uh, using our uh, self-driving shuttle. Uh, we have a stop here uh, at a gate uh, near uh, the Terhils Resort and the central facilities, so the restaurant, the, the, um, the swimming pool, etc. We have, of course, a stop at the main uh, parking of the site because um, Terhils is uh, basically car-free. Um, so, of course, um, we need to connect the car park with all uh, uh, points of attraction. We have a bus stop here at the Cable Park, which will uh, open this weekend, because the Cable Park opens uh, 1st of April. In winter, it turns out that people are not uh, extremely uh, willing to go on the water, it turns out. And then finally, of course, where we are now today, here near the Tehils Hotel, we have our final stop in quite a vibrant area, I would say, where we also are building an event zone, which you can see outside of your window, the Masmechelen Village Shopping Centre, which has a direct connection as well, and then here the Tehils Hotel, the Euroscope Movie the Theatre, uh, so this is also quite an important uh, stop here at the site. Very briefly, our project timeline. So we are currently in the pilot phase of the project, which I will uh, go into a bit more detail very soon now, which started basically in August of 22 and uh, will end in May 23, so in two months, with a decision of our executive board on whether or not we want to continue with uh, the, the self-driving shuttles. Of course, we are doing everything we can to make sure that uh, this is a no-brainer that we want to continue with that. Um, so depending on, of course, the technology success of the project, but also the usage, uh, the user experience, the business case, etc., that decision will be made. If we get a green light there, we will jump into a final implementation phase, so a transition phase in which we do infrastructure works. We will optimize roadway. We will build uh, a depot for overnight charging and for maintenance of the vehicles. We will make some optimizations to the roadway. We will upgrade the fleet to probably five uh, or maybe six vehicles um, to make sure that we can meet the transport demand of the site. And we hope to be finished with that by September 23. Uh, when we are done with this transition phase, then we start with the real operational phase, which is going to last for 10 years. So we have a 10-year maintenance contract with EasyMile, 
which in itself is not easy to get a contract for an innovative transport system for 10 years, but we managed to find a way around with it that the maintenance contract includes a swap of the fleet uh, around halfway, so that we will get uh, basically an upgrade to the new vehicles that they are currently still developing uh, on uh, during the course of the project, so that we are also sure that we will be uh, always equipped with the most uh, up-to-date technology and the safest and best and most comfortable solutions that are on the market. Um, a bit in detail on the project timeline, so if you zoom into it, we have several sub-phases in this pilot project. Um, of course, there has been preparatory work um, at uh, the factories uh, in Toulouse, also here on site, dry runs without passengers. But we actually started with passenger transport beginning of November, uh, in let's say the, cl the classic way, of course, with still an uh, operator on board. Um, we have um, try to optimize, of course, the performance of the vehicles during that time, uh, worked on comfort and things like that. Uh, and then we, made a then we started to involve uh, a remote control center, the supervision center. So the idea is, of course, that in the end, there will be no longer stewards inside the vehicles, but still somebody somehow needs to keep an eye on the system as a whole. So in the end, the autonomous transport system will have an operator in a remote control center who, uh, ha who keeps an eye on the system. Now I'm jumping basically to that phase six, but the, f the ultimate final stage of the project is basically that this remote control center is also monitoring the transport system in a passive mode. That means that nobody is actively watching the system all the time. It just has to be somebody who is present in the, uh, in the dispatching, and if there is an issue, there is an alert from the vehicle itself coming to the dispatching, and only when that happens, the operator needs to uh, uh, act or, or intervene. So the safety, the, um, the remote control center can never be safety critical. That is a very important element uh, in our project. Um, but so after the, the initial runs with a steward on board, we uh, started to involve that dispatching uh, together with an operator on board. And as we are now, we are in phase four, which means that we have an undercover operator in the vehicle. That means that there is still somebody qualified physically in the vehicle, but he tries to blend in, trying to pretend being a tourist, um, you know, probably watching his phone all day, I don't know, because at that point, the, the, uh, the uh, silent operator has no longer an active role because the, um, the whole operations is done from the remote control center. So that is the phase that we are in today. So if you are doing the test trip, you will also experience that. But we are now awaiting the green light from our independent safety assessor to uh, make that transition to stewardless uh, any day now. And after that, uh, so they start with uh, an, an eyes on mode from the dispatching. So at first, the dispatcher will actively monitor the system, but uh, after uh, some time, that will go to that final passive uh, mode, as I indicated. So yes, we are right here. Um, maybe shortly about the living lab for uh, the hills. Uh, so a long-term, fully autonomous transport system is, as I try to indicate, quite unique, but it's also a rare opportunity to collect real-world data on autonomous mobility. The field of research around autonomous mobility uh, is still very much, let's say, artificial, and I don't mean to insult any of the very good researchers here in the room, but we work a lot with virtual data, with hypothetical survey scenarios, etc. Uh, here, the idea is that we have a real-world transport system that we can use to do, for instance, human factors research on what are people's user experience, what are their perceptions, what are their mode choice, uh, etc. Uh, so we make this whole setting, the vehicle data, we make it available for research to make sure that we can reach a maximum impact not only here at the hills, because of course we want to use it to optimize our service, but to get an impact uh, also for future projects. 
Uh, and we also want to offer a safe and controlled environment for testing autonomous vehicle technology. Here you see a picture of a recent test that Flanders Make has done here, where they use their own autonomous vehicle to test a prototype LiDAR uh, from an American company. So we were not allowed to uh, disclose it, so you, you, see, uh, you see that it's blurred a little bit. But the idea is that we can also do technology tests, either with having full vehicles here at the test site or with subsystems that can, for instance, be mounted at our own vehicles. Very quickly, because I see that I'm running out of time, I want to highlight a couple of challenges, but also opportunities that we identified. So first challenge is, obviously, it's not a ready-to-go product. You, just, you don't just put a self-driving vehicle down and it starts driving. There is a lot of effort in that implementation, so you, do not need, you don't want to jump into these projects too lightly, because it will take a lot of time and work to make it happen. Um, secondly, safety first. Safety is critical, uh, but how do you guarantee it? Uh, the way we have done it, and I, I'm convinced that is the best way, we have hired an independent safety assessor to assess, to take a real deep dive in all procedures and technology uh, that, is, that is here. So EasyMile prepares the safety case and the independent safety assessor uh, validates it, and we think that is uh, very important here. Um, to ensure that we have uh, maximum safety during these tests. Stakeholder management, also very important. Uh, we have many partners here on site and also elsewhere uh, somehow involved in the project. And of course, not everybody is always on the same line. Some, uh, and, and it's also, uh, you know, the problem is getting bigger when you're working with innovative technology that nobody has really ever experienced before in practice. So that stakeholder management uh, is something that is uh, important to take into account for these kinds of projects. Also, we basically need to reinvent the wheel in a way. Uh, it turns out that a bus driver does a lot more than just driving the bus. Um, it's, he also has a communication role. He has a role in terms of social security, ensuring that people are uh, feeling safe. Uh, there's also a role in selling and checking tickets, etc. And all of these things you need to rethink when you remove the human from the system. So that is also a big challenge. Uh, performance and or fallback scenarios in extreme weather conditions. We have been fortunate to have a, a couple of snowy days this winter, which has learned us a lot, um, which has also learned us that basically the system can handle quite extreme weather conditions if you anticipate uh, well, like for instance, a snow clearance of the track to make sure that you clear the snow well enough to the sides so that you don't pose any, uh, any obstacles because piles of snow can be seen by the sensors as a, pos a possible obstacle, etc. Of course, many opportunities as well. Uh, one of the most important quotes that I remembered from one of my professors is that a good transport system costs money. But a bad transport system does not cost you much less. So what we expect is that we can get to a business case with this system, which is competitive to a more classic bus with a driver system, but with a superior level of service. So instead of having like one bus with a driver every 20 minutes, we come to a fleet with five or six vehicles, which gives you a frequency of one bus every few minutes, which is a level of service that is almost unachievable in the classic way. Mobility has a unique experience on this side, so it's an, an, an extra point of attraction that's also very important. Um, it's a unique asset, as I already indicated, that offers several possibilities for, uh, or several opportunities for research and innovation. Uh, so we also want to cherish that part, of course, because we are an investment company that wants, to, uh, that wants to make sure that there is economic growth and innovation, and we want to make that happen here as well in this field by providing this ecosystem on autonomous mobility. And finally, of course, there is hopefully a lot of positive uh, PR related to an innovation project like this. Uh, of course, if you somehow make it horribly go wrong, the PR will probably not be that positive, but we are once again convinced that we have all the safety procedures and all the uh, professional uh, equipment and partners on board to make sure that this is a positive story that comes to a positive conclusion. I thank you for your attention and I invite you for questions if you have any.
I'm government, so we're interested in deployment. So where do you see opportunities uh, for deployment? Because I don't see them in a, in, in a short notice in the center of Amsterdam, but mm -hmm. where would there be an interesting business case, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I think there are several interesting business cases and physical locations where this can take place. Obviously, private sites like this one, so bigger sites that, that, has, that have some challenges in connecting the dots, so to say, are, are an important one. But I don't think that it necess necessarily has to be a private site, because basically we initiated this project from the perspective or as if it was a project on public roads. The independent safety assessor, which is, of course, quite a big expense, um, is not something that is mandatory on a private site. On a private site, you are your own boss, so to say. You don't need government permits. You, you don't need these kind of evaluations. But, of course, we want to make sure that we don't jeopardize safety here. So we, ta we have taken everything as seriously as possible so that it also means that I think if we can make it happen here, it can also happen on public roads in certain contexts. So the complexity of the transport is, of course, important. So we have a relatively low complexity environment here with relatively few interactions. Um, so that is important. So it's, uh, it's difficult to introduce it into a shared space environment today, not because it's not safe, but because it is too safe in the sense that the shuttles are like, you know, the granny in the car who are scared of everything, so they just stop and wait. Uh, so if you introduce it in a very complex, busy environment, you will just have a very slow system which doesn't really meet its target in that sense. So I think there is one of the technology challenges, uh, but it's more from an operational perspective than from a safety perspective, I think.